Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 157. So glad you could join us. Uh, today's guest, Linda Nemec Foster, will be here in just a little bit. But before again, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too. So please do click the like button and share, subscribe. Anything you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be most welcome. Now, we'd like to start the show with uh, the Poets Respond poems that we had for this week. And we have two again. Uh, we have one from Sunday and a forthcoming poem, uh, which we're going to run on Wednesday. But let's talk to Sunday's poet, Seth Simmons. He's right here. Uh, hey, Seth, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Um, and you're in New York City, right? Yes, Brooklyn. Yeah, and so um, so your poem was inspired by the death of um, of Dean Young and um, his his poetry. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about how the poem came to be and, and what Dean Young meant to you? Sure. Um, uh, I never met the man myself. Um, I know him through his poetry and through students of his and professors of mine who know him, knew him. Um, and uh, I guess... I think it's probably evident in the thing itself how much of an influence he is on me just in the way he moves through a poem. Um, and uh, I would say as a writer, a thing that has stuck with me was just seeing just another another poet I, I follow on the internet um, said once many years ago, I want to say like five years ago, I saw him tweet this, that uh, Dean Young said that one of the most vital things you know a poet can do is uh, record the natural world um, before it vanishes. Um, and I think I've sort of felt internalized that heavily. Um, uh, and I know, you know, Dean himself wrote often about loving life and the need to love life. And obviously he had a lot of reason to, um, I mean, that was a very loaded thing for him. Um, and, uh, had a lot of, it was very, just a lot of complication to it. Um, and so I try to chase after that as well. I think, um, that's sort of the animating thing for me. Um, in terms of how the poem came together, um, I think I write pretty just instinctively from, just, I feel it out as I go. And I had the first line um, in my head when the debt got canceled. Um, and I just sort of moved step by step from there. And I knew in my head going in that Dean would appear because he was there. Um, mm -hmm. And then he came in and uh, yeah, it uh, is all just sort of mysterious, you know, the motion. From there. It really is. And that's the thing that always stood out in Dean Young's style. Is just the way he moves, just you never know where he's going from one line yeah. or even one phrase or one word to the next. I mean, it's just very, um, just one of the most free poets, I would say. Um, how does the a poem, like, how do you move that way? Do you, um, is, does a poem come in one swoop and you sort of just let whatever happens happen? Or does it slowly piece its way? Is it like a puzzle that you you move around? And is there a lot of editing? How, how does a poem like this come? Um, it's different poem by poem. I do feel like a lot of the things I've written that I feel are the better things I've written usually do come out um, in one swoop, sort of like the other Poets Respond piece I did a few years ago. Um, but um, sometimes I'll put it on the back burner if I, uh, you know, just hit a wall and I think some other stuff needs to happen to me in my life or in my day for me to go back and know what to do there. Um, in terms of just sort of the nitty gritty of it, I'll write a line and then I'll think, uh, what does this make me think about? Uh, what is you know, the association that I have with this? Um, and maybe I'll go with whatever the first answer is, or then I will ask myself, what is the, associ so, so, that, the association I have with the first association? Because um, I do want there to be some space um, between the things and for it to move in unexpected ways. Um, but uh, yeah, usually I just go little line by line. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to go ahead and read it? Do you have it with you? <clears throat> Home with a javelin at the end. All poetry is about hope. Dean Young. Thank you, the president, for canceling my debt. I will use this reprieve from hopelessness to write one poem, early in which the speaker will discover an absence of hopelessness is not exactly hope, more like emerging from too wet water into the wet air, and you left your towel in the car. Also, you locked your keys in the car, also, the car is on fire and you're late for your endoscopy. The great poet Dean Young died this week, and all I have to say about grief, he said better. In a number of books, it should frankly be a crime to be able to write. I'm trying my best to love life as it vanishes. It's just the more I love it, the more apparent its vanishing becomes. Did you know the armed forces of Ecuador once airlifted to safety, a population of Galapagos tortoises too slow to escape 
the erupting volcano they called home. All I have to say about that is me and who, which is also what I'll say about the time they gunned down from helicopters tens of thousands of feral goats mucking up the place. Imagine living 150 years just for some goats to eat all your food. Now imagine living 60 something years just for every level of government to give up on protecting you from the novel coronavirus. Everything is so stupid these days, as opposed to the rest of history, which I recently, through the power of mindfulness, experienced all in one flash. Much to unpack. What I'll tell you is Shakespeare was definitely one guy. The strong have never given, there's my dog, hush, have never given willingly to the weak. And Peter actually denied Christ four times, but the last one was under his breath. Look, everything's useless until there's a use for it. Even knowledge, even grief, even this anger I don't want or understand. Even these rusted swords, this tunnel with no light at either end. I'm told we have to imagine a better future before we can build one. And here I'm stuck imagining a better past. Columbus tripping overboard, Lincoln keeping Hamlin on the ticket, all the other dominoes falling that way instead of the way they did. Maybe the things to imagine the present as if from the future, a very distant future, a world of pristine consequence understandable only by turning that big bronze telescope to the ancients, e.g. you and me and whatever it is we're doing here. <clears throat> Graduate students of tomorrow, hello. I hope you are compensated fairly for your labors. I hope your research is funded by an endowment taxed out the wazoo. Mostly I hope your world is as alien to me as mine is to you that I have not by living this life condemned you to the torments of my own lineage. May whatever javelin you're sharpening be purely ornamental, a javelin of peace, even a javelin of celebration. I wish I could celebrate with you, but alas, I died many centuries ago after a long, handsome life solving all of humanity's problems with my mind. You're welcome. I'm so sorry. Please don't fuck it up. Yeah, excellent poem. That was uh, Seth Simmons with a poem with a javelin at the end. And uh, before we go, Seth, I, I noticed, uh, I've noticed before when we, we published a poem before, that you do a um, newsletter that is, or news, something that's comedy and working class combined. I write a what letter is about, yeah, I write, it's called Humorism, humorism.xyz. It's on hiatus right now, but there's a lot of writing there about um, uh, labor inequality and extremism in the, the comedy industry. Interesting, um, yeah. I, uh, you know, my side gig when I'm not a poet, um, just kidding, um, my main gig is writing journalism, um, sort of about labor issues and comedy. Um, and Albert, hush, but there's, um, he's upset that I'm not paying attention to him. Um, but I write, you know, sort of about radical um, extremist elements uh, within the comedy industry. I write about, you know, exploitation and abuse um, and um, sometimes about, you know, nicer things. Yeah. Well, very cool. So everybody can check that out at uh, SethSimons.com. That's S-E-H-T-H-S-I-M-O-N-S dot org. SethSimons.org. So uh, check oh, that I out. Oh, I actually, I did buy the dot com domain back from a squatter. Ah, so, did um, you? Well, there you go. So go to either place. But uh, thanks so much for joining us, Seth. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And, uh, and don't mind the dog. We love uh, pet cameos around here. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank take you. care. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, so that was uh, Seth Simons with uh, my, uh, Sunday's poem. And now tomorrow's poem is going to have to be the um, Ecrastic Challenge winner, the second one. But uh, Wednesday, we're going to run Alexander Unless's poem. And uh, we have Alexander right here right now. Hey, Alex, how are you doing today? Hi, Tim. I'm good. Just uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. It's uh, I don't know how many poems of yours we've published, like three or four now, five? I don't know. It's a good number, but it's always great to see you. Um, do you want to explain, since nobody has any idea what this poem is, uh, what it's about and how it came to be? So I have not written a publishable poem in a long time. I, I probably shouldn't say that. I haven't written a poem I feel comfortable publishing in a long time. It's probably been about two years. And, um, you know, you get that feeling like it's hard to explain, but it's that little like spark inside. And uh, the other day I was reading this article about this bald eagle 
that this handler was taking on a Southwest flight. And I thought to myself, how, how odd is that for this eagle to be on this plane? Like the eagle can fly, um, and yet it's flying on this airplane. And um, I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And then I'm a teacher, just started the school year, and um, I'm teaching the Iliad for the first time. And um, I was eating food and I was just surprised by, I was just surprised by a lot of things that day. And I got that little feeling and I sat down and I wrote a poem and I'm very happy that I, I wrote this poem because I miss, I miss poetry. Yeah. Well, poetry. I miss being able to create poetry. (laughs) Yeah. That's just wonderful. Uh, Why don't you read it since nobody's uh, um, heard it yet. And then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Okay. The deluxe edition. This morning's stories include a bald eagle about to board a Southwest plane, his handler taking him through the TSA checkpoint in North Carolina, him flexing his wings as if to say, look what I can do. I can fly and I can fly. Some things still surprise us. This eagle's flight, how delicious my breakfast tastes today, green stuffed olives with almonds and fresh striped figs, their skins filled with August ripeness. And Fagel's translation of Homer's The Iliad open to page 265, Achilles always dying and also always living, speaking again, two fates bear me on to the day of death. One, a journey home with no glory, Another, a journey away from life, but with everlasting glory. Oh, the choices we must make in any life. And I wonder what Homer would have to say about an eagle on a plane. The pages he might have filled today with wings being winged in an aluminum miracle. Everything so different and everything the same. How we still get from one place to the next or don't. How an eagle is even now an eagle and an omen that tells us there is always something new to see. Open your wings and look. Yeah, just a beautiful poem. I love that uh, with the wings being winged in an aluminum miracle. I mean, that's a line that sold the poem to me. Um, but I just love um, having for change, <laughs> you know, poets of, of or poems of, of joy, you know, something celebrating life. Um, it's a little bit rare. How often are you able to, to publish a positive poem versus a negative poem, do you think? Is it something that comes? Never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never. And so here's what happened. I, I started a new job last year and the school that I'm teaching for, I'm teaching humanities, ninth grade and 10th grade, and they're really big on positivity and optimism. And they wanted me to share a poem with them that I wrote and I was looking and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I can't share any of these poems. They're all so dark. Um, And then I told them, I'm gonna start writing more positive poems because you're right, like the tendency is to be negative. Um, So I was really happy when you said you found something positive in it because I think that it is harder to write a positive Mm -hmm. poem for me but I'm trying. Yeah, I think for everybody. But it's just, I love that the the school is focusing on that. That's such, I mean, there's such like a, you know, misanthropy and depression crisis. And, you know, I mean, some things are bad, but some things are amazing miracles, like the Library of Alexandria you have in your pocket and that we can zoom and that the eagles can fly in a plane. I don't know. I mean, there's plenty of things to be celebrating in this life as well as um, as things to be upset and worrying about. So it's just wonderful to bring in that into poetry, too. I'm so glad you could. And I'm so glad your school's doing that, especially. Yeah, it is. It's refreshing for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Alex. It's always great to see you. Thanks for joining us and hope you have a great uh, rest of your school week. Thanks. You too. Bye. Take care. And that was Alexandra Umless with uh, her poem. Uh, the Deluxe Edition, which is going to be Wednesday's poem of the day. You can find more of Alexandria's uh, um work at her website which is alexandra alexandra umlas m u m l a s dot com alexandra umlas dot com here's the, the the screen view of it right there so um do check that out and uh we're gonna take a quick break and come back with our main guest uh linda nemick foster so uh hang tight and i will be right back
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Like I said, today's guest is Linda Nemec Foster. She's published five collections of poetry, including Amber Necklace from Gnagst. I don't know how to pronounce that right. Uh, Talking Diamonds and uh, The Lake Michigan Mermaid, uh, which was created uh, with uh, co-author Anne-Marie Oman and artist Meredith Riddle. She's received nominations for the Pushcart Prize and awards from the Arts Foundation of Michigan, National Writer's Voice, Dyer Ives Foundation, the Poetry Center, Fish Anthology, and the Academy of American Poets. In her 2021 book, which I have right here, The Blue Divide, was published by New Issues Press. A new collection of flash fiction, Bone Country, is forthcoming in 2023 after being honored as a finalist in several national competitions. The first poet laureate of Grand Rapids, Michigan, Foster is the founder of the Contemporary Writer Series at Aquinas College. And here she is, uh, Linda Nemec Foster. Hey, Linda, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing fine, Tim. It's wonderful to be with you. We had a very dark and stormy day here in Michigan. So it's uh, I'm glad and pleased to uh, join you today. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's always a pleasure. Um, and, and we have uh, sunny blue skies, so blue uh, that you want to just puke because it's blue every day. That's how we live it. <laughs> but uh, why don't you start out with a poem? Do you want to read the first one you had? Yes, yes. Um, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, thank you for the, the, the bio and the intro. And uh, some close friends may know this, but m maybe most of your audience does not. I am the granddaughter of a Polish immigrants who came to America before World War I. So I still have a lot of family and friends and relatives who live in Poland. A lot of them live in Southern Poland, South of Krakow, near the Ukrainian border. So what is happening right now in that part of the world is very close to me. Mm -hmm. It very it hits not only close to the heart, but close to the bone. So what what I do in the Blue Divide, history is really an undercurrent in uh, a lot of the book. It's, there are four main themes in the book, but history is one. And so the first poem I'm going to read is from the beginning of the book that deals with some of that history in that part of the world. And before uh, Putin's war in Ukraine, because it is a war, it's not a military operation, it's a war, uh, probably the, the biggest um, upheaval in Europe was the Balkan War of the early 90s, when Croatia and Sarajevo and Bosnia and Kosovo were under the grips of ethnic cleansing and some uh, awful stuff that was going on. So anyway, the first poem I'm going to read is about that Balkan War of the early uh, 1990s. And it's about a performance of hair. There was a, uh, for you young people out there, there was a very famous American rock musical called Hair uh, back in the late 60s. And um, so I talk about that musical being performed in Sarajevo during the Balkan War. And this poem is called Report from Bosnia, Hair Performed in Sarajevo. The age of Aquarius is sung in broken English to a packed house in a small room. The actors do not take off their clothes at the play's finale. We're already dead from the war, one singer says. But they ask the audience to sing and join them on a tiny stage. They perform only when there is electricity. More than a dozen performances have been interrupted or stopped because of mortar shells. The artistic director, who also doubles as the bass guitarist, plays with a gun strapped to his waist, black revolver stolen from the cold grip of a dead Serb. A young boy sitting on his mother's lap in the fourth row, smiles for the camera. My name begins with A, he says to an interpreter, just like Aquarius. Next week, he will be killed with eight others standing in line for bread. At his grave, there is only his picture nailed to a wooden board, no name. They've run out of letters. Yeah, very sad poem, a report from Bosnia, Hair, performed in Sarajevo. And that is uh, one of the earlier poems in the book from The Blue Divide, Linda Nemec Foster's newest collection. Um, and really a poem that's that's timely right now, of course, with what's going on in, the, in yes, Ukraine. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. as, as a matter of fact, um, a reviewer told me, if you just substitute dead Russian for dead Serb, hmm. 
and uh, Odessa for Sarajevo, um, you get the same thing. Yeah. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So what was, um, how much, you know, what was the writing, um, how did the book come to be? Like, why did you choose to write about the topics in Blue Divide? And, and, and how did the research go into how much did you do? How much was family story? How much was stuff you picked up along the way? And how much was, was actual research? Very good. Uh, well, there are four main themes to the book. Uh, history, as I just said, art, relationships, any kind of relationships to, to uh, nature, to friends, and then family. And history has always been uh, just, um, I'm a history nut, history fanatic, and maybe that's old school or old fashioned, but I am. And um, I think it's because of where my blood is from, where my family is from, you know, uh, Poland, Eastern Europe, the, the whole sense of history has really been strong for me. So I, I love to read about history. Uh, when the, the Balkan War happened, um, I was uh, very, um, as I said, it was close to my heart, close to the bone, uh, because it's so close to where my uh, roots are and my uh, native people are. And I just did a lot of research about that war. I, I actually love doing research for poems. I love doing research, whether it's history or art. We'll get a little bit about art in a while. But um, I think it's just fascinating to learn about um, other people, other places, other landscapes. Mm -hmm. And landscape also is very important to me, not only as a person, but as a, as a, as a, as a poet, as a, a way to function in the world as a, as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will love a place as much as I love the person that's attached to that mm -hmm. place, whether it's a home or a yard or a tree uh, is very important to me. And of course, relationships and family and the older I get, the more that history of family uh, surfaces and bubbles up. So uh, that's part of it. But yeah, research is is important and, and I love it. Uh, the history, the uh, sequence I'm going to read later soon uh, called The Artist Notebook, I had to do research on such artists as Bernini mm -hmm. to find out a little bit more about his personal backstory. I mean, his uh, Art may be divine, but not the guy. <laughs> not the guy. <laughs> Would you say uh, that, that the poems come out of research, or does research, or, or do the poems guide the research that you end up doing? Like, is there something you're curious about? You know, you want to write a poem, yeah. then you do research, yeah. or are you just yeah. researching yeah, and then the poem? Comes? No, that's it. The, the The poem always comes first, or the idea comes first, mm -hmm. or the line comes first, or the image. Yeah. Uh, and then the research, you know, after that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's read that next poem, the artist's notebook. Okay. This is. Um, uh, a long sequence in uh, seven uh, parts, and they're all 14 lines, but they're not real sonnets. I mean, they're not iambic pentameter, uh, either Shakespearean sonnet or Petrarchian. They're just my, my own 14 line of pieces. And um, they uh, involve the work of Michelangelo and Da Vinci, Frangelico, Bernini, but also some um, also fine artists that you may not know of, uh, one was a very dear friend of mine, a contemporary American landscape painter called Jim Carcina. And the first piece in the artist notebook and the last piece, uh, they're both about his art. He was a very dear friend who died a few years ago. So I'm going to begin with um, the first uh, 14 line piece in the artist notebook. And each of these seven pieces are subtitled. So this first one is how to paint an approaching storm. Pick a clear day while they still exist. Blue sky, yellow sun, the predictable boredom of a calm landscape. Blend in the anxiety of waiting, the cicada suddenly hushed, the hawk lost in its endless spiral. Keep mixing the afternoon in colors that are silent, gray of stone, black of the stone shadow, the palette of dusk arriving too soon. Close your eyes and count to 100, to your birthday, to the square root of memory until the sky splits into a crooked river of light. Now stop, feel the rain on your face as if for the first time, as if you have never been here before. 
two, the American and his wife dream in Florence. Of course, they would dream in this city full of art and their human yearning to create the divine. In the husband's dream, he becomes Fra Angelico, complete with Dominican robes and a frescoed wall in a Florentine monastery. He paints the Annunciation, imagines Gabriel, the rainbow colored wings, the concave body of Mary waiting to be filled. Her hands crossed in such tenderness, he cries himself awake and startles his wife from her dream. She was swimming in the air, a small girl floating in the gilded corner of a baroque ceiling. The walls covered with mirrors, the floor covered with pearls, silent, except for the sound of a boy counting each one, his hands filled with small moons, his voice filled with her name. This uh, next section is a persona poem, and I assume the voice of a portrait that uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted before the Mona Lisa. Three, portrait. More than 20 years before his Mona Lisa, he painted me, Ginevra, a young woman from Florence who married too young and died too soon. No wonder I look beautiful and distracted no hint of a smile to tempt you with speculation. I'd rather dream of the landscape behind me, dark clouds of juniper echoing my name, soft rumor of trees reflecting memory. Who will remember me? My arms and hands are missing, unlike the famous Mona. I could blame the artist, but what's the use? It's not easy being here, motionless, with my beauty adorning virtue, his words, not mine. The perfect caption for a bride who has no chance to turn back and disappear, disappear into that invented landscape of sky and water. This next piece is about the infamous Bernini. And I begin by talking about some of his art pieces. Four, backstory. The open mouth of St. Teresa and her ecstasy. The death of blessed Ludovica and its mirage of light. Pluto's wide hand on the marble thigh of Proserpina and the tears that seem to stream down her cheek. All this passion by Bernini can overwhelm any young tourist, but it says Daphne and Apollo the girl growing leaves and roots while the God is in hot pursuit that makes my daughter gasp better than Michelangelo. But she doesn't know Bernini's backstory, the jealous rage that made him force a servant to slash a woman's face until it wasn't a face. But why ruin the moment? No artist is perfect, even though the art can be. Consider his Teresa and her angel, the marble floats as if it's already in heaven. Five, art and life. Who can sculpt grief like Michelangelo? His writhing slaves, incomplete and still locked in their marble wombs, mirrored in agony, only matched by his. He knew how to perfect it on the silent face of a perfect Madonna, mother and dead son. But imagine this other grief at the moment when another woman's grown son died, not by crucifixion, but by cancer. She crawled into his hospital bed, held him and sang lullabies until he was cold. What image embraces the deeper pain? the art enshrined in a large church or the private tableau hidden in a corner of suburbia. Our master of grief cannot answer, only ask another question from the silent marble growing from his hands. This next section is um, really inspired by the 
wonderful, fresh vision of designer Alexander McQueen and one of his muses, Lady Gaga. Six, the modern artist laments the post-postmodern world. When will it end this incessant march towards deconstructing the already too fragile world? Performance artists shun old fashioned nudity in, fair, in favor of wearing raw meat dresses and skyscraper high heels that look like horse hoofs. Even Duchamp's descending nude can't compete with the image of a cow's tendon covering the pale breasts of a woman in Soho. Her hat, a giant halo, a giant stuffed stingray flapping in the breeze. She'd rather eat it. I'll eat my hat than attend any outdated exhibit with, and I'm quoting here, that flat stuff on the walls, stuck in those boring frames, the lonely islands of three dimensions, static in the air. And this sequence called The Artist's Notebook ends with this final portion, final section, and it's called Gift, and it's also uh, about Jim Carcina's work, the American artist I talked about earlier. And uh, he gave one of his beautiful landscape paintings to my son and um, his soon to be wife. And it was such a remarkable, generous gift. And this is about his graciousness to my, to my family. Seven, gift. A year before my son met the woman he'd marry. You painted this landscape of rocks, water, and thin line of horizon. The, pl the place consumed by a lake and its obsession with the idea of blue. The idea hugs the shore and won't let go, not for the stark branch insisting on its existence or the boulders losing their sense of decorum with wild layers of movement. Isn't that how love works? The spinning and falling obsessing and wondering what happens next. The view from this high bluff can't predict the future, let alone the future of our children. Impossible to know from this height. All we can do is give the gift and tell them to hold on to each other, to that idea of blue, the expanse of the landscape that can't be contained in a single image. That's what you give them. Yeah, it's a wonderful sequence that was uh, sequenced. The Artist's Notebook. I'm going to be reading poems from The Blue Divide uh, by Linda Nemec Foster. Um, and it's just great to be able to, to dive into a longer poem a little bit and, yes. and let the words wash yes. over us, I think. Yes, um, yes. How did, can you explain how the, the organization of this book came to be? How, the, how you turned, how you, how you merged the, the four really kind of separate topics into one theme and titled it The Blue Divide? Like, what does the right. title mean? Right, right. Um, well, this is a very interesting question because the original title was Pictures of the Floating World. Hmm. Uh, and um, when New Issues Press accepted it, I, I was a little backstory here of, of this book. It was a finalist or semifinalist in about 12 national competitions with that title, Pictures of the Floating World. And the, that particular poem in the book is about 9-11. Uh, but at any rate, when it was uh, accepted by New Issues Press, shout out to them and Nancy Eimer is the editor out of uh, Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. She loved the manuscript, but she said, we've got to change the title. And first of all, uh, Amy Lowell has a title, uh, the same title, Pictures of the Floating World. I think at either won the Pulitzer or it was a book she published mm -hmm. right after she won the Pulitzer Prize in the 1920s. And then she knew of another poet who had the same title, uh, Pictures of the Floating <laughs> World in his book. And he said, and she says, it's just too much. It's just too much out there. So let's look at what you've got in that manuscript and what we can use for a title. So she came up with the blue divide. And that is a line from another poem in the book called, I believe it's called The Water. It's about my mother and father and the divide between them mm -hmm. that not even two daughters could bridge. So uh, that seemed like the perfect title because the book 
um, the whole book is not only about what divides us, but what can um, bind us together mm -hmm. and bind us together on our common journey, whether we're looking at the stark reality of war in Bosnia or Sarajevo, or the, the wonderful vision that artists give us in, mm -hmm. in their work, uh, despite some of their imperfect lives. Um, uh, the editor was really struck with that whole sense of division, mm -hmm. but that whole sense of bringing together too. And I thought that was just a, a perfect metaphor, a perfect title for, for the book. And also the word blue, I did not realize this until a reviewer told me this, the word blue uh, appears in the blue divide 33 times. Ah. And I didn't even <laughs> know that. I had no, and let me tell you, blue isn't even my favorite color, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. <laughs> but um, it just like, for instance, the, the last poem at the very end of the artist notebook, I talk about um, that idea of blue to hold on to each other, to that idea of blue in the, the landscape with the, the, the blue sky. And again, I did not plan it that way, but this blue is an over, uh, really an underlying theme, even bef underneath the four, you know, main uh, main themes. And uh, my editor loved it, and she said, "Let's just go with it." Mm -hmm. And the other reviewers have loved it too. So. It, it works. So yeah, I, thought, the, I the, thought it was a great title. It just reminds me of like a, a blue river, you know, and the yeah. way that divides countries and then the bridges that we build over them. Right. It's a, that. Right. That's what right. comes right. to mind for me. Right. And then right. we have the way that the new issues always has that sort of uh, monochromatic type tint to the, the yes. books that they do. It kind of, it's a really, right. really right. nice uh, combination. Very, yeah. And, and a good um, uh, insight, insight into their design, their book design mm -hmm. and how they, uh, for, uh, you know, format that. And uh, going back to your other question, so that's the uh, answer to the title, but going back to your other question about how I did the collection, um, I don't know about some poets, but for me, I spend a lot of time sequencing a book, a lot of time. And I think of it as, okay, you write the poems of a manuscript. And then when you piece them together, and I love that challenge of doing it, uh, it's almost like writing the poem of the book. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're writing the poem of the book. And this is what I do every time I, uh, uh, you know, piece a collection together. And for the Blue Divide, I was struck by those themes of uh, history and art and relationships and family. And each of the three sections of the book has a little bit of those four elements. And I just loved how that uh, flowed back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the book. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's hear the next poem. All right. The next poem is also about art, but it's a segue into relationships too. It's uh, called Mount Fuji, uh, inspired by the, the great art of the Japanese artist, Okusai, and uh, he's very famous for his painting, The Great Wave off uh, Kana, uh, uh, Kanazawa, uh, Kanagawa, Kanagawa. And he was, um, he lived from 1760 to 1849. But my dear friend, Therese Becker, my uh, best friend in the world who died a number of years ago, loved Hokusai. So this is about art, but this is also about Therese Becker, Mount Fuji. My friend always wanted to see the mountain with its eternal snow, but she never crossed the ocean to Japan. Instead, she bought a small reproduction of Hokusai's boy viewing Mount Fuji and hung it on her bedroom wall. Every morning, it greets the daylight, the boy with his back to her as he faces the mountain and plays a flute. His body perfectly balanced on a thick tree branch that seems to slice Fuji's heart with a rugged abandon. In another life, she vows, I'll come back as that flute, the hollow reed content to be held and hidden in the boy's hands. Another beautiful poem. That was Mount Fuji from uh, The Blue Divide, Linda Nemec Foster's newest book. About the last topic, uh, Padre O'Donoghue says, uh, you must always separate the art from the artist, but never separate the art from the truth. 
I love that. Uh, That's a great, uh, great line there, that Potter. Is, that is a great line. Yeah. Absolutely. Because given I'm just going to hit on Bernini here, and hopefully, uh, well, I know he's dead, but hopefully his estate won't, won't sue me for this. But the bottom line is, yeah, in his personal life, he was a creep, but his art was just amazing. And it still amazes me. And uh, if someone in our audience doesn't know much about his art, Google him. And uh, just looking at Daphne and Apollo, not even seeing it in, I won't say in the flesh, in the marble, not even seeing it up close and personal in marble, you will be amazed with the, um, just the awesome beauty of, of that piece. So that's great. Never separate the art from the truth. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Here, I'll put it on screen just for people who haven't uh, seen that, that, that Benini uh, painting right there. That's the... the um... Apollo and Daphne that uh it's the sculpture. About. It's yeah. sculpture. The sculpture yeah. I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It it really is is uh quite quite amazing. Yeah, that really is. Ah. <laughs> mm. Um so uh one thing that's really interesting about your background is that you um worked before you became a poet, you were a social demographer. Oh um, yes. Can you ex- explain what that is first of all? Okay, and then how does that, that transition into poetry because it seems like oh. it might be related. Well, it yes and no. Uh, believe it or not, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, majored in political science, sociology, and economics in college, not even English, mm-hmm. literature, not even creative writing. And I wanted to go into broadcast journalism. Ah. I wanted to go into like, you know, Nora O'Donnell. I wanted to, you know, be that kind of uh, like a uh, news reporter a broadcast news reporter. So um, I did, I was told, don't, uh, you know, go to, don't worry about journalism or journalism school. Uh, Study those topics that you're going to comment on, politics, economics, society, social issues. So that's what I uh, majored in. And when I was a junior in college, I had an internship uh, at the local NBC news affiliate here in Grand Rapids. I did, I was there for six months with an internship, uh, going on news crews, writing copy, and uh, doing all this work. You know, it was a, a hard job, but I did it for six months. And Tim, at the end of the six months, I realized I hated it. <laughs> yeah. I hate H A T E D. I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, here I am at the end of my junior year. I have a full ride scholarship. I don't want to change majors and maybe lose the scholarship. So I decided I'm just going to finish my degree and graduate and figure out what I'm going to do after that. So in the meantime, after I graduated, I got a job here at the Center for Environmental Study here in Grand Rapids, which is um, an agency that looks at the environment, ecology, uh, population growth, uh, diversity in in not only society, but the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get a a two year job right after college in at that um, uh, agency because I had the degree for it and I was their social demographer. And what I did, I would study population growth Hmm. and um, marginalized society, marginalized groups, and who was getting, uh, who needed the money and who was not getting the money because of inequities, Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, uh, political system. So that's what I did for two years. And then after I got married, um, even before that, though, even before I got married, though, I was writing poems for myself, Mm -hmm. but never, never for publication, never for anyone else. And I went to a uh, community workshop here in Grand Rapids at an independent bookstore. And people there took me under the wing who were published poets and really encouraged me. One especially was uh, Richard Jansma. And uh, when I moved to Detroit after I got married, uh, he said, there is a poet who's teaching at Wayne State University. You must study under her. And her name is Faye Kiknasway. Mm -hmm. And I started uh, taking classes from her at night because I was, you know, uh, working a nine to five job, nine to five job every day. But at night, I would take these night classes in creative writing at Wayne State University. That's where I learned to write the Sestina and the Villanelle and what a sonnet was and what a sonnet is not. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And she encouraged me to get my MFA. 
and I went to, uh, I applied to Goddard College in Vermont for the low residency MFA, the first low residency MFA program in the country. And I was accepted in 1977. And I worked with people like uh, Donald Hall and Liesl Mueller and Raymond Carver and uh, Louise Gluck and Stephen Dobbins. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the, the beginning of the beginning. With so many uh, great teachers, is there one who stands out as the one you learn the most from? And, and, yes. and is there one thing that you learned that, that you could yes. pass along? Can I see, can I name two? Yeah, go ahead, name two. Uh, Lisa Mueller, <laughs> Lisa Mueller. Uh, and I learned the, the love of language and sound and music and how myth and folklore and fairy tale plays an important part in our psyche, not only as poets and writers, but as people. Mm -hmm. And I loved what she did with uh, history. History was always important to her. She was born in Germany, was able to escape Hitler uh, in July of 1939, right before the outbreak of World War I in September of 39, which happened when Hitler invaded Poland. And so our, uh, her and I had uh, a lot of uh, uh, commonality in our love of history language, folklore, mythology, and fairy tales. So that's Liesl Mueller. And then with uh, Stephen Dobbins, uh, he opened my eyes to my own uh, ancestor history of Polish poetry. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, even though I'm Polish American, I didn't know much about poets such as Czesław Miłosz, uh, Wisław Zimborska, mm -hmm. Zbigniew Herbert, and Stephen Dobbins opened my eyes to those poets in translation. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and of course, his his work was phenomenal. Yeah. His poetry and how he taught me the craft of the hard labor of writing a poem. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I think we should talk about that a little more later. Um, yeah. But but I should say too, if anybody has any questions for um, Linda, please leave them in the chat windows either on Facebook or YouTube, and I'll pass them along. Um, Facebook or YouTube, not Twitter, because I don't look at Twitter during the show. Um, but let's hear the next poem first. All right. Well, let's talk about family now and let's talk about where I came from, my hood. Um, I came from a very working class, blue collar, underemployed, unemployed neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio called Slavic Village. And back in the 20s and 30s, maybe even the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 50s, 60s, it was filled with immigrants from Poland and Ukraine and the Czech Republic. <clears throat> Slovakia, Russia, Lithuania, Hungary, and it was very poor and, uh, depre and uh, 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 depressed economically, very rich culturally, but depressed economically. And now <clears throat> it is still a neighborhood in Cleveland, still named Slavic Village, but these are the new immigrants still marginalized from Central America and Latin America and um, Africa. So it is like a melting pot of the new immigrants, but still the economics and the uh, social strata has not changed. So this is how it was in the 50s when I was little. The Immigrants and Slavic Village, Cleveland, 1955. The Hungarian kids wear thin jackets, missing buttons, stain of paprika in their mouths. The Czechs pretend they know everybody's secrets even those of Slovak Joe who spits at their shadows. The Ukrainians can't stand the only neighbors who can understand their language, those goddamn Russians who starved their grandparents to death in the 20s. The Lithuanians refuse to open the blinds after dusk, something about the night air stealing the breath of infants. And the Poles, those men and women in love with the black Madonna, wash their hands before touching their children, the sons and daughters as pale as water. At night, the moon gets tangled in the open arms of the dead oak tree on Salem Avenue and can't decide if it's winter or spring, summer or fall, the same bareness waits to embrace it every night. Yeah, that was uh, The Immigrants in Slavic Village, Cleveland, 1955. Great image, you know, images playing out, revealing that landscape. Yeah. Um, since the last two were short, let's jump right into the next one. 
All right, the next one is long. And now we're getting into family here. And this is about my daughter. Uh, she studied astrophysics in college. And don't ask me even. <laughs> and this poem is about that. This poem is what I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. So um, I don't have to explain anything because I don't get it. So this poem uh, explain, uh, talks about my un lack of knowledge, but it's really also about family relationships, as you'll see. So I talk about uh, physics things like quarks and protons and neurons, and I don't know what they are, but you don't need to know either. The poem is here for you. The poem tells the truth. So uh, the poem begins with an epigraph from a catalog. This began the poem, Tim. If you wanna know how this poem began, this was what started it. Mm -hmm. I read this quote in a catalog from the teaching company where they talk about the theory of everything, quote, a vision of physical reality so at odds with our experience that it defies language. So I decided to use language in a poem. Yeah, that does sound like a challenge for a poet, doesn't it? <laughs> challenge. So here it is. Here it is. It's called The Theory of Everything. Einstein's theory of relativity can be stated in one concise sentence. But what is it? What noun placed next to what verb modified by what adverb holds the secret? I asked my daughter, the aspiring astrophysicist, to speak the sentence. If not the concise sentence, then the undulating lines of pure thought that describe the theory of everything. Her mother, who froze in high school geometry, cannot comprehend how tiny strings vibrating in a microscopic universe can hold everything together, from DNA's double helix to the silky translucence of a moth's wings to box concerto for two violins. How it can all be reflected in 11 dimensions, 11 parallel universes wrapped in empty space, a dark energy of nothing. My one dimensional mind boggles as my daughter explains, but the messy world of an atom's nucleus, the photons and quarks, the positrons and muons, the wimps and Higgs boson all blur in my tired head. She describes a famous physicist's lecture, and I can only imagine him at the podium with mismatched socks, dark blue of sky mistaken for dark black of night. No use searching my finite space for a unified theory, but I can hardly recognize my own daughter as she lives more and more in her own universe and leaves my small world behind. The daughter who waxes and wanes like the moon, loves me and pulls away like the tides, listens to a rock group called the Magnetic Fields, sing about the unscientific mess of love, loses car keys and forgets to turn off the stove when the primordial soup boils down to nothing. The daughter who as a child was lost in the Chicago Museum, filled with the physics of Magritte and as a smaller child, noticed the silica shimmering in a lake in Nova Scotia and deemed it diamonds. This woman who now peers at the stars in the night sky and sees the same brilliance. And in the morning, thinks the warm air of a January thaw is not fog, but the broken snow on fire. The woman who knows the textbook explanation yet wants to believe in the flames. The daughter who looks at me with my cosmology of tentative words, tentative silence, and tries to see the mother, the proof that experience does defy all language and everything, everything is connected, whether we can dare to believe it or not. Yeah, beautiful poem. Even the, even the fiber, fiber bundles uh... Yeah. Bridge of the Blue Divide. Um, yeah. And there's uh, more poems from uh, Lyndon Emick Foster's book, The Blue Divide. Um, and that is a good segue um, to another topic I wanted to talk about. And maybe I thought we'd play this poem. You're not going to be able to hear it. But your granddaughter Lila Foster's poem, Black, was just in the uh, Rattle yes, Young Poets Foster. Anthology. Oh, yeah. wow. A yeah. shout out. Hi, Lila. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, so she uh, sent us the recording of it, so I can play it here. You're not going to be able to hear it, but this is Black, her poem from the summer issue 
Okay. Um, I'll play this. So you just sit back for 19 seconds, Linda. And All everyone right. else will be listening to uh, Lila's poem here. This is um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Black by Lila Foster. Black. Black sits on a chair in front of a computer screen, braiding her hair. She hums into wind and sinks into ocean. She likes sweet candy and she loves the night sky because it's black. Black feels like a big couch, a small soccer ball, a blanket with stars. Yeah, just the per- perfect poem for right there. A blanket with stars oh, at the end. It was Black yes, by Lila Foster. Yes, uh, I love that. <laughs> oh, well, here's a little backstory about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, during COVID, now, Lila is now eight, but she was six when she wrote that poem. Mm-hmm. And this was early on in the lockdown. So early March of 2020, and, and she, early March in 2020, schools were just shut. You know, and they did hybrid stuff. They did stuff online. And Lila at the time was in kindergarten. So she was doing, you know, online stuff with her teacher. But I decided to offer uh, poetry lessons every day. So every day from early March until early June, like the end of the school year, we did uh, poetry prompts. And sometimes it would be uh, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Every day, sometimes an hour, depending upon her attention span. And we would write about things like her favorite colors, her favorite animals, uh, her favorite dolls and, and, and pets uh, and toys. And it was just a wonderful experience. And during that time, I think she wrote about 40 to 50 poems. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember early on when we were doing the, the, uh, the colors, I said, now, Lila, what's her favorite color? And she said, black. I said, and I really try to steer her away from that because I didn't know what she was going to write about. Like, mm, that seems like such an adult color, right? And I said, well, how about blue or pink or green or yellow or red or orange? Uh, and she said, no, black, black. And and she kept on tugging at me and I finally had to relent. And I said, well, why, why do you want to write a poem about black? Well, it, it goes with everything. And I'm, I'm sure she heard an adult say that. But anyways, uh-huh. she stuck to her guns. And I'm glad she did. Because the first image she came up with, because I said, well, what do you think Black is doing? If Black could do anything, if it was like a person, imagine Black as a person, what would it do? She said, well, I think it would be, it would be in front of its computer braiding her hair. Mm. Black sits in front of her computer braiding her hair, and then it went on from there. Yeah, it's just a wonderful thing. I mean, we love doing the Young Poets Anthology every year. It's one of the highlights, just seeing all the submissions that come in. Yeah, and different voices, different submissions, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they just have such originality and such freshness. Sorry for the motorcycle driving by. My windows have to be open. (laughs) <laughs> but um but but you worked for over 20 years as a as yeah. a creative writer in the schools. Oh, Can you talk about that great. experience and yeah. Yeah. It was the best Tim and I'll tell you a little bit uh a postscript, you know, after I, my little explanation, but from 1979 around there 1980 until 2002 and remember that year 2002 I worked for the Michigan Council for the uh, Arts and Cultural Affairs for their creative writers and schools program is a big hyphenated word creative writers and schools program and i worked um every academic year uh sometimes five major residencies a year k through 12 throughout the state of michigan they could be public schools parochial schools private schools they didn't have charter schools yet back in the day but it was uh those places they would write grants for these writers, and there were only 11, uh, no, no, excuse me, maybe close to 100 of us, 100 of us that were uh, kind of um, uh, curated and uh, by the state saying that you're, you're a good poet, you're a good teacher, you're, you're on our list, our roster list, and there were poets and fiction writers and, um, uh, you know, playwrights. It was a wonderful program, and I would do let's say five residencies on academic year, anywhere from a, th- a few days to a few months. Mm-hmm. And one of the, mo- the best residency I did was in April of 1996. I did a residency at Hall Elementary School for third and fourth graders here in Grand Rapids. It's now called Cesar Chavez Elementary School because it's in a Hispanic neighborhood. And there was 
my first day there, there was a shooting after school mm -hmm. in the parking lot. Uh, thankfully, no one was injured. No one was killed or hit. But uh, the young student was arrested and, and that was that. But uh, somehow, though my poetry workshops for the rest of those couple of weeks really galvanized those students and their voice. Mm -hmm. And it gave them power and it gave them uh, this confidence that they could write about things that they were afraid of writing about and yet having it be okay. Mm -hmm. having there be no you know value judgment placed on it and i would say listen my job is to let you know there is no wrong way to write a poem there is no right way to write a poem there is your way to write a poem and my job is to help you find what that way is mm -hmm. and so they they wrote some magnificent poems and then at the end in may we had a wonderful a celebration of their work. We had a little booklet, you know, pu published for them, celebration of their work at a, a local um, art center, the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts. And a lot of the students were saying, oh, you know, my, my uh, family won't be there. And uh, I, I, I bet no one's going to come for me. And what was interesting, the school had rented a school bus after hours to take their children and their parents because a lot of them did not have their own transportation. So how wise to think ahead and just provide uh, the transportation for them to and from the art center. Mm -hmm. And it was a marvelous experience. And one little boy uh, who was adamant that no one was gonna come for him, um, his whole family was there, even cousins who were in rival gangs in the neighborhood, they had a truce before the, uh, the event and they both walked in together. They, they came together. Oh, wow. And I remember he told me before he left to get uh, back on the bus to, you know, uh, go back to his neighborhood. He says, uh, 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 teacher lady, they called me teacher lady uh -huh. uh, or no poet lady, poet lady. Um, I will never forget this. Hmm. I will never forget this feeling. And that's what the poets in the schools and the creative writers in the schools in Michigan for me mm -hmm. was all about. Now, the bad, sad segue is that program is no more. It was gutted. Oh, that's too bad. It was gutted in 2001, 2002 by the uh, Republican governor at the time, John Engler. Mm -hmm. And that I'll name the names because that's what happened. And that was sad. And they said, oh, you know, it'll be back. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll, we'll bring the program back. And it never it yeah, came. that's just too bad. And we still have California Poets in the schools. There's a wonderful program that does the same yeah. thing here in California. And um, it, yeah, Good for you. it's just amazing, you know, how much you can do, though, you know, how much you can inspire people. I mean, I don't know how many over 20 years, so many classes, so many kids, yes. how many poets are poets now because of that early and, class, you know? And you know, you make a good point, uh, Tim, and you wouldn't have known this, but uh, last uh, month I did a, a reading. Actually, it was benefit for Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees mm -hmm. in Poland. I did a benefit at a independent bookstore here. And there was a man who was also in the anthology and he took one of my ekphrastic workshops back in the day, community workshops when I think he was in college or I, maybe even in high school. And he remembered that. And now he does community workshops. Mm. He came up to me during the break, during our reading that we did together. And he said, you don't know the influence uh, you had, mm -hmm. not only on me, but how many hundreds of people I've taught since then. Yeah, um, for sure. Maybe, yeah. Said, maybe even a, a thousand. So you, you never know how just a small mm -hmm. act can really reverberate and resonate. Yeah. So thank yeah. you for ripples in the pond out. and then they make their own ripples and they just continue. Yeah. Just a wonderful yeah. thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we have two poems left. Um, yes. Let's do A Kiss is Just a Kiss. Okay. This is about, we're talking about family now. I talked about my, my son getting married to his you know, future wife and my daughter with her astrophysics. This is about my mother. And all you need to know about my mother, she was obsessed. She was obsessed with two things, cleaning and gossip. Gossip about movie stars. And she would read all this, these tabloid uh, things before People Magazine and us. There were things such as Confidential, The Lowdown, Hush Hush and Uncensored. And she would, you know, read those avidly. And so I talk about that. I talk about famous uh, movie stars, Ava Gardner, 
the Jean Harlow, Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford. And I also talk about things my mother used to clean her home. Window wax was something that was like pre-Windex. You would put it, it was like either a, a, a white or pink foam mm -hmm. that would harden, but you'd wash it off and it looked great on a, a window or a mirror. And also Prussian bluing, it was a laundry additive when you uh, put it in the laundry only for whites, not for, you know, colored clothes, only whites, it would make, believe it or not, this blue stuff would make white shirts even whiter. So this is about my mom. And it begins with an epigraph by Ava Gardner. A reporter once asked her, describe your business, describe show business. And she said, quote, it's the kissiest business in the world. You have to keep kissing people, Ava Gardner. A kiss is just a kiss. My mother, in her own words, didn't know much. But what she knew, she knew. How to darn a sock's hole until its universe imploded into a white dwarf of string theories. How to polish window wax into a mirror until it reflected a gaze more intense than Snow White's stepmother. How to magically stir the cauldron of laundry to transform Prussian bluing into a pure white shirt. And then her encyclopedic knowledge of movie stars, she never called them actors or actresses, but stars as in the heavens, the constellations, the Big Bang. Her lessons were taught by chain smoking gossip columnists. She pored over their theses, illuminated in the pages of Confidential, The Lowdown, Hush Hush and Uncensored. My mother could tell you how Jean Harlow really died. It wasn't kidney failure, but she was poisoned by all that peroxide she used on her hair. How Greta Garbo brushed her teeth. She never used toothpaste, only salt. How Joan Crawford plucked her eyebrows. She didn't, enough said. My mother loved the backstabbing of it, the kiss and tell of it, the guilty pleasure of it. And when she read this quote from Ingrid Bergman, a kiss is a lovely trick designed by nature to stop speech when words become superfluous. My mother, with her blue hands, an absent husband, almost believed it. Oh, another great poem, A Kiss is Just a Kiss. I love that opening quote. You have to keep kissing people. <laughs> I'm never going to think of showbiz the same way again. Uh, there's more poems from the Blue Divide. Oh, what a drag. Yeah. <laughs> You're kissing them. Oh, <laughs> Um, let's see. So, so you, um, a lot of poems are about, um, of yours are frastic and art based and, yes. um, including the prompt that you have give, given us for later, yes. which we'll read that's, a little later. It's that's a frastic right. prompt. Right. And it is because I think Tim, mm -hmm. I'm a frustrated artist. Uh, that's I a... think I wanted to be a visual artist that never got beyond stick people. So not just in the blue divide, but in all of my books, I actually have 12 connect collections. If you count the uh, six or seven full length books and then the chat books, it's 12, but I have so many poems on, on visual art. And Magritte is a big, I mean, I have a lot of poems about Magritte. Not that he's my favorite artist, but he rattles my chain in a way that no other artist can. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've always uh, loved art, appreciated art, and I think secretly I wanted to be an artist. Well, you anticipated my question was why poetry and not art. But uh, but the follow up question, um, do you have any advice for people writing uh, McFrastic poems? Because we have, you know, the McFrastic Challenge every month. Um, yeah. How do you, is there a way that you approach it that, that you could advise? Um, what I would do is lose yourself in the art. Don't really, I know, you know, whenever you write anything, either a, a poem or a short story, you bring your own life to it. But in a frastic art, what I try to do is immerse myself in that art and speak from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And you don't have to be an art historian. You don't have to be an art critic to really appreciate it. Even if you don't understand, like Magritte, whoa, I've written so many poems about him. And do I have a clue as to what he's doing? Not necessarily, but there's something about his work that's haunting to me. So I enter it. I leave my doubts and my, uh, my left brain out of it and just assume the, the art and dive in. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Uh, one last question, then we'll do the last poem. But your uh, your next book is a book of flash fiction, Bone Country. Yes. It's yes. coming forthcoming next year. Um, yeah. uh, what is it about flash fiction for you? How do you? It's something that people just always ask. What's the difference between flash fiction and prose poetry and a regular poem? Is there a, is there a way that you you uh, classify those? Um, uh, I heard Stuart Stuart Dybeck, famous poet, famous short story writer and flash fiction author too, said, well, the difference between a prose poem and flash fiction is prose poem is single spaced and flash fiction sometimes is double. <laughs> That's not necessarily, you know, the God's, you know, the gospel truth, but um, it's very fluid. And it all depends on the editor. For instance, one of the pieces that's going to be published in uh, Bone Country won a major award out of Ireland last month. I was invited to the West Cork Literary Festival to read that piece called um, On the Other Side of the World. And um, it's only 300 words. Hmm. And their idea of flash fiction was, wasn't 310 uh-huh. or 305, 300 words. So a lot of it is fluid because of what the editor wants you know they may see flash fiction as 500 to 1000 words so i think one has to just be um open to uh uh what the form can engender of course uh what's different for a lineated poem you have a lot of space around it Mm -hmm. you have a lot of white blank space right you have your uh, line breaks and stanza breaks um but with a prose poem number one it's just one black paragraph, usually no more than half a page, single spaced. Uh, and it has um, just uh, a sense of movement, resonance, resonance, and um, surprise. Mm-hmm. And it has to be complete in that black paragraph. And I don't even indent the paragraph. It's just, you know, a black paragraph. Flash fiction is, is uh, it, it can be longer. Uh, and although Bone Country is, uh, you know, you could call it prose poems, you could call them flash fiction, and most of those pieces, it's they're around 90 pieces, and most of them are one page mm-hmm. or one and a half pages. Yeah, it's one of those things, and people try to submit, you know, they, they sneak in submissions, and it's really good, and I'm like, you know, this is, this uh, is seven paragraphs, uh, but... It's still a poem, I think. I don't know. I don't know how to define it myself. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, uh, Tim? I think that's good. I think that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the undefinable. Good. The undefinable. <laughs> they are. You, you kind of know it when you see it, too. It's like yeah. uh, you know, pornography or whatever. <laughs> so, um... As a matter of fact, maybe I shouldn't say this, but there there is a poem about that mm-hmm. in own country. Oh, that's I funny. Won't. I won't even mention the title, but <laughs> well, everybody give us somebody give everybody something to look forward to. Uh, it's right, forthcoming right. in bone title next year. Um, <laughs> but let's hear the the last poem, the dream uh, that is forgotten. Oh, oh, is that the one you want oh, me is to? Oh, not? Did I have the I, wrong I, one? If you, I, uh, I was oh, it's the, um, the first anniversary. The first anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, I flipped you... to the wrong page. It's my fault. Yeah. Ah, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I think it's right before it. It is, yeah. yeah it's right before it. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I had to, um, uh, of course, include a poem about my father. And um, this is about him and about the landscape that uh, the city that his uh, mother and father uh, came from in Poland. On the first anniversary of his death, I dream of my father. I don't exactly dream of him, but his voice. I'm calling from Krakow on the last night of my trip. Dad, I speak into the white phone. His voice on the other end sounds deep and hoarse, as if he has a bad cold or has been talking a lot. Yeah, he replies, I'm in Krakow, your mother's city. Oh, really? How is the weather? Fine, it's been good. I want to tell him about this place he's never seen, the market square gleaming like afternoon light, no matter what time of day it is. The starlings swooping like a black cloud in Groszka Street above the statues of the Twelve Apostles. Hearing my favorite Chopin nocturne played in the Bonarowski Palace by a young Japanese woman. Gee whiz, I could hear him say, a Japanese woman living in Krakow. How that nocturne reminded me of him, the long goodbye I never got to say. But I just talk about 
inconsequential stuff. The heat wave that turned into a soft rain last night. The ugly form hotel finally boarded up and turned into a giant billboard for Polish beer, the one and only Zhivyets. That's nice, he says. Well, I gotta go. I've been talking too much over here and I don't wanna lose my voice. Somewhere on the edge of the city, a strong wind embraces the birch trees, changing their green leaves to silver in the thin morning. A great little turn there at the end. Excellent poem on the first anniversary of his death, I Dream of My Father. Um, one of the last poems from The Blue Divide, Linda Nemec Foster. Thanks so much for being a guest today. It was Thank a pleasure you. talking to you and listening to your excellent poems. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. It was my honor, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. That was uh, Linda Nemec Foster with her newest book, The Blue Divide. She's got The Bone Country coming out next year as well. You can find more of uh, Linda's work at lindanemecfoster.com, spelled um, just like it is right here on the screen. Um, that would be right there, Linda Nemec, N-E-M-E-C, Foster, lindanemecfoster.com. So do check that out. Um, now we are going to take a quick break and go to our open lines. Um, how the open lines works, if you're new, um, I'm going to deploy the Zoom link in just a moment. You can join the same line that uh, Linda was on. And um, I'm going to get it right here. Uh, first, though, email your poem to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com so we can show it on the screen as you read and everybody can read along. Only come over to the Zoom link if you want to share poems. It's just for the open lines. If you are not uh, interested in sharing poems, just stay right where you are. It's the best seat in the house, uh, right on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, so you can read along and, and watch the poems as people read them. Um, so just sit tight. But if you would like to share a poem, send it to openmicrattle.com, and then get the Zoom link, which I'm going to deploy right now. And I'll be back in just a moment with the open lines. So uh, be right back. And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Uh-oh, someone does not unmute. Hang on. It's supposed to automatically mute. Okay, I think we're fixed. Anyway, okay. So we are back. Thanks for your patience. Um, now, this is the open lines portion of the show. Join on the Zoom link if you would like. Like I said before, you can read poems about whatever you'd like. Uh, you can read poems from uh, about current events. You can read poems about um, the prompt from last week, which was this. Uh, it was last week's prompt right here. Write a poem about every place you've ever lived, how it felt to be there. This was from um, um, Elizabeth S. Wolfe. Um, this was one, uh, last week's show was Prisoner Express, and this was one of the prompts that she gave to the, the people in Prisoner Express. Uh, write a poem about every place you've ever lived, how it felt to be there, what made that place different or special, beautiful or terrible, what did you see or eat there, how did it smell, what did you pass on your way home? That was the prompt for this week. Um, and I have two poems here, because last week I, I forgot, or I didn't finish. I couldn't quite get the ending of my poem right. So last week's prompt was to write about a, a piece of dialogue you overheard, if you remember. And uh, mine was, uh, this is a true story. We had a used, uh, 
or not used car, a classic car festival. Um, the Mount, 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 Mountain Classic Car Show, I think it was called, um, up here where I am. And uh, this is a scene I overheard and some dialogue I overheard and um, turned it into a uh, tetrameter sonnet. So here you go. This is an old men stalled at a stop sign. This was last week's prompt by me. Old men stalled at a stop sign. Slow with a clutch, you ancient horse, one shouts. The driver swipes his cap. The spark, it's not a bloody Porsche, he says. And now they're in a slap fight, stuffed inside the Model T. I only want to check the mail, not watch Three Stooges in 3D, colorized, blown up to scale. Sunlit, the roasters gleaming green. For years, they only came in black. But what is seen can't be unseen, and people long for what they lack. One stops to laugh. It's out of gas. I told you so, you stupid ass. And that was a true story. One of the funniest, most comic scenes I happened to oversee um, as I was checking the mail last week. Um, so that was last week's poem. And this was this week's poem. I, lately, I've been, um, I don't know, feeling a little bit, maybe a little left brainish, And um, so I thought I would would plug straight into the uh, the right brain, the, the the unconscious. And I wrote one of these little poems called a train poem. I always think of them. I actually think of them as like, like there's a hole in your in your my temple right here and if you listen to the tracks that are coming out of the hole long enough you can hear a sound and then the train starts coming and a poem just appears that's kind of how it works so i have no idea where this came from and what this is but this is my everywhere i've ever lived poem it's called a noble gas everywhere i've ever lived is tucked inside a blue balloon loosened in a child's hand she's standing in her fourth grade field her classmates counting down the soccer lines look almost real beneath her feet in painted grass an unseen bee inspects a clover waiting for the shade to pass when all at once their strings let go as if the sky itself could gasp and everywhere i've ever lived is pressing on the inner walls and pulling up her written note and when you find it tangled in the neighbor's fence i hope you'll call the number and tell whoever answers where it went that is my little train that came out having no idea why or where that metaphor came from or what it means but that was fun to do it's always fun to do a little meditative exercise so let's see what you have on the open lines. First, we will go to, um, let's do Carla Schwartz. I'll just go in the order of um, people we have on the screen here. Hey, Carla, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing very well. Thank you uh, for everything for tonight and for asking me to read. And I have this poem, which I just want to, okay, yeah. And it's called, um, so I, you know, I didn't understand the syntax of this uh, prompt uh -huh. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> It was to me. Uh, it was not syntactically correct. So um, <laughs> it was interesting. It definitely left us with room for uh, creative interpretation, which was kind of fun. <laughs> right. So I I um, I wrote it in the way I could interpret it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so this is called "Last Day in the House." The day begins like all previous, each blurred into a daily sameness. My daughter, the elder, nudges me away from my bare sleep, commands I take the pills, the pills she knows will be my last. I don't know what I take anymore, the long capsules, bronze, white, orange, I slip my tongue under and swallow with water. I find it hard to stand, but I have to pee. I know I need to use a remote, but by my side, there are three and they all look alike. Just like these days I live all slurred into each other. Finally, my bossy daughter pushes the button that lifts me from my chair, the chair that's been my home these last, I don't know how many years. Have I ever not lived here? In the bathroom, my other throne, my daughter lets me sit and do my business alone, but with the door open as she paces, waiting until I'm done, until she sees me safely ensconced in my chair again, so she can mop the bathroom floor, clean a mess she blames me for, a mess that isn't even there. Sorry about the page break. Ask me what I had for breakfast, huh? I don't know, food, nothing at all. Hunger has left me, flavor has no appeal. I need only 
remember the Katz's pastrami I shared with my oldest friend before the opera. The trash truck screeches around the corner. But what's this now? A bed in the middle of the living room? The room I've been living in, my only home, me, my chair, and my TV. Everything else, gone. One day, gone. The furniture, the books, my daughter always prepared in advance for this day, my last day in this house, she tells me. I want to go back to my chair, but she insists I lie down. Medicare, she says, won't pay the ambulance if I can still walk. So she pushes me back into the bed each time I try to get up. My other daughter calls. I hear hear something, but the elder daughter puts her off. What year is this? It's, I've been in this house almost 50 years. I climbed that ladder to the roof. I grilled the salmon through and tender. I drank the cheap wine I aged to perfection. When it would snow, I let the shovel ride the slope of the driveway. My wife died here too. I wanted to, too. Every day I tried, but now my daughter tells me this is my last day here and I didn't succeed. I thought I was ready, but now I'm afraid. Where am I going? Why can't I stop crying? Uh, that's a heartbreaking poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. Very powerful, Carla. Thank you so much, yeah, Tim. That's beautiful. A... And your audio sounds great, by the way, the new microphone oh, or whatever you've got. It used to be really uh, quiet. Oh, I'm using a Bose tonight. Um, Okay, that's good to know. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Carla. Okay, let's go to um, Cindy Damone next. Hey, Cindy, are you there? Hi, I'm, I am here. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. So where are uh, you calling from, first of all? Uh, Riverside, California. Ah, right down the hill from me. Well, it's nice to have you join us. What do you have to share? Um, uh. So am I supposed to put it on screen or anything? Um, well, normally I would, but if you didn't email, if you emailed it to me, I'll show it. If not, you can just read it and we'll listen. Okay. All right. So I will uh, bring it up on the screen here. I should be able to uh, read it myself. Okay. Uh, you're still there, right? I'm still here. Yeah. I might have to let you share. Yeah, I can... Okay. I can let you share screen. We can try it that way. Okay. Um, let me Let me bring it up first and find it. Um, it's so hard to find these things. <laughs> and thank you for being patient. Yeah, no me. problem at all. Because this is the first time I've ever uh, shared anything. Yeah, uh, normally you could just email it to me um, at openmike at rattle.com. Then you don't have to worry about it, and I can just show it. That's how we usually do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can find it here real quick. If not, I'll just well, bow we can out. Also, uh, we can come back to you. Let's let's come back to you after you find it. All right. Let's okay. do that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, let's go to Dick Westheimer instead. All right. Hey, Dick, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Tim. We also had that lovely rolling thunder today with oh, the don't rain. Don't make me jealous. <laughs> we, the rain we wish they could have given you. Such yeah, a good... I mean, we have we have a chance of rain next week. Like in about a week, we have like a 20% chance. So everybody cross your fingers. There's actually a fire again. Um, it's it's the other side of the mountains down by, um, I don't know, Azusa or something, the, the, the reservoir there. And, and they, speaking of, remember that last poem? Um, I wrote about people being firebugs, being everything. Some guy set three fires and they arrested him trying to set the fourth from what, what I've heard. But there's a huge fire down there by uh, the other side, 12 miles away from us right now. But So we got a few, you know, a week until it burns here if it does, but we'll see. Oh, well, hopefully you will get a little, you'll get what we got. Yeah, that would be nice. It would really would. Good. Uh, one or two tonight. What's your... Um, let's see. We got, uh, I think we could do two. Okay. As long as they're not long. Yeah, well, too, you know, everybody who's who's here, if you have two poems, that's fine, as long as they're like a page. You know, two page max, I will say. Yeah. Okay. Um, I sent you one uh, in open mic, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll read that one first. Sure. Okay. And the, briefly, the backstory is that a, um, a beloved worker in one of the local independent bookstores was struck by a bike, mm -hmm. struck riding her bike home from work and killed. 
Oh, that's too bad. Oh, the ghost she, bikes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she um, conducted the open mics at the at the bookstore and was the bookstore manager. And the whole bookstore closed down for a week and went down to her home place to spend time with her family. And yeah, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, called Ghost Bike in Memory of Gloria San Miguel. And ghost bikes have become part of the global ritual of bearing witness to cycling deaths. They are all white bikes and they serve as an infrastructure of grief. There is a new boat ghost bike this time parked outside the door of the store where she worked and where she lived. Her partner and daughter now have a ghost lover and a ghost mother. The shop weeps books. They throw themselves from the shelves and tear out their own pages. At the open mic she hosted, those gathered sit and exhale ash and cry words that rhyme with why. The poets have no more rhymes, only cold lattes in their hands and that stage of grief when everything they hold burns. And everyone knows there will be more work for the ghost bike makers. In time, partner and daughter will take ghost pages back in their places. The store owner will return each book back to the wrong shelf. In those books, they will close their covers and sigh, then get back to work of reciting their one story told in infinite tongues, the ghost bike rider's voice whispering in each one. Yeah, touching poem and, and such a sad image, those ghost bikes. I saw an article, I mean, it might've been you sent the article through uh, Poet Respond, but, uh, but I remember learning the article and, and it is heartbreaking to see those, yeah. yeah. Well, um, and well, the story stand, stands on its own. It was one of those ones where I questioned writing somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. But I know, I mean, and I think poets are supposed to witness the world too. So who knows if someone would have written a poem, you know, I mean, we're here, we're here to witness too. Yeah. Uh, and the other one was Poets Respond poem. Mm -hmm. uh, the fall is measured in heat and dust and ruined fruit. And I think I could have written this poem any day this summer or any day this year, uh -huh. but uh, there was a particularly, um, uh, the, there was the study that came out sort of showing what the con the increased heat waves and what those look, will look like over mm -hmm. the next uh, 30 to 70 years. Um, so it, it's not pretty. No. The fall is measured in heat and dust and ruined fruit. It's not the first time I've been startled by my tomato vines. Yesterday, they were, they were emerald capes draped on their trellises, ornamented with jewel red plums, black hued crims, and oh, those brandy wines, big as fists, gravid with juice. Today, the fruit lies strewn each with a sawn tooth rip in its flesh. Raccoons, I suspect. I'd meant to harvest yesterday to make sauce and salad today, but the news, it's always the news. Yesterday of my in-law, Paul, alone in room 304 of University Hospital, trussed and prodded and penetrated by the tubes they say nourish him. But the cowries are not finding their way in, past the screaming raw of his throat. So he's in there and I'm out here grieving the slaughter, the drag down vines tangled at my feet. I know Paul will recover and I know I will eat. And I know that the trees in these parts are only shedding a few leaves. So here it's fine. Paul will be fine. The weather is just fine. But there a Buddha emerges from the dried up Yangtze. Overheated hens refuse to lay eggs. They fire rockets at clouds to try to make rain pour out. And over there, the coal barges run aground. Bridges over rivers look down on dust. Even the grain prays for rain. The heat is not the heat of the growing season, but of some oven stuck on high. The good news, the fuel will burn out. The bad news, we are the fuel. Yeah, great poem again. Thanks so much for sharing that, Dick. Uh, even the grain prays for rain. Yeah, like everybody does. Uh, yeah, thanks. Just, just if folks aren't looking, we you know the news doesn't reach us. They've had seventy degrees of 
heat wave temperatures over 100 degrees mm-hmm. over half of China. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with intense drought. I mean, it's it's. Yeah. Yeah. It's serious for sure. Yeah. Right. Well, so, uh, well, thanks for sharing that, Dick. It's always a pleasure hearing your poems. They're always great. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yep, take care. Bye. Uh, let's go to us. Uh, let's go back to Cindy uh, Dumone and see if uh, if she's got the poems ready. Cindy, you there. Yes, I am here. Um, I will leave myself off camera if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem at all. So, um, did you uh, do you want to just read a poem? Yeah, I'm, 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 I have it ready to share. If you, yeah, go that. ahead. I can, I can do. I think I turned it on so screen share, and we can try that. I don't think we have ever done it before. Actually, go ahead. Well, I, it doesn't show up. Not viewed. Does it show up now? I think it's coming. Um, Oh, but you know what? I can't really get it on screen. So let's just hear the poem. Okay. All right. I'll just read it. Okay. Oh, wait. I can see, we can see it now. I figured it out. It just, uh, we, we got it. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Now, now the, um, the title still needs to be finished. Water, gas, and. <laughs> <laughs> the I-5 traffic flows. I see Shasta Lake If only we weren't filling the skies with greenhouse gases, causing a 22 year drought, then the lake wouldn't be 150 feet lower. Yellow bypass on the sign. If only we could bypass the once only thing, then we might not have ignored the warnings, throw up our hands and say, we are too late to solve this crisis. At mile marker 71, traffic slows to a crawl. If only I had left 1.5 hours earlier this morning. At mile marker 79, the big rig is mangled and on its side. If only the driver had slowed just enough not to tip over. Mile marker 171, second traffic jam. Dead stop for 10 minutes. If only travelers had alternate routes in these Northern California mountains. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Cynthia. It's a poem I can really relate to. <laughs> I'm driving the, these same roads. Um, thanks for sharing that. It's a great, great pleasure to have you on. Okay. And so do I need to stop sharing? Yeah, I think you do. Let's okay. Let's see if I, I, can, can. I can do it. Okay. Uh, we're all, all right. set. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, so let's go next to uh, Mike Bales. Hello. Um, this show is awesome. Thanks, Mike. I'm uh, glad you think so. Um, if I, I can always expand my repertoire of poets that I listen to and follow by seeing all the people you feature. Uh-huh. Um, I got two poems. One's four lines longer than than a page. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry about but it. <laughs> I formatted it through another there, way. There's skinny been. lines to you. Everything is everything is fluid, and, and I'm not I'm not getting mad at anybody. So don't worry about that. Um, so which um, one do you want to do first, though? Um, Slant of Light. Gotcha. It's out of a magazine called Star Poets. Oh, out very of the cool. Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The editor likes to publish me there. Very good. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Where can we? Is there a website we can find that journal? It's a really small homemade one. Mm-hmm. I I I research their stuff posted. You know, like if I forget the address, I can see like the address and things uh-huh. like that. Well, that's it's very a pretty cool. small magazine. So I'm not really sure what online presence they have. Mm-hmm. Well, at least I like love how see- much stuff is going on. You know, there's so many journals and things. It's great. Um, she's a really nice lady, too. If I ever was up there, I think I could stop by and say hello. She kind of gave me a half-assed invitation. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I like to say where the poems are set. Uh-huh. This is actually, the poem is actually set in, like, in central Iowa when I'm driving around. Mm-hmm. It's called Slant of Light. Day shadows, the roadside rolls, miles counted in the countryside. Memories shimmer, the radio plays, classic rock and ballads, old love arises as new. Once she said it was in my head. And now, two years later, a fire burns when we, when again we meet, more seasoned as I perceive. And now the sun lingers over horizons like freshman romance, the remnants of summer, with a de- gentle touch of autumn gold, day into night whispers a savored dream. Ah, very cool. Great picture you paint there. And that was a slant of light. 
And then uh, we have another one too. Let me pull it out. This one's the prop poem, Wayside, right? From two weeks ago, Distant Places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of combined it. Nebraska's a long ways away. There are two, there are two places in, in Nebraska. The first part is when I was working by Valentine, Nebraska, which is in, in the northwest part of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. It takes hours to get from here to there. And the second part's in the northern part of Wisconsin, of Nebraska, just south of of um, Vermilion, South Dakota. Uh -huh. So two little distant places here. Very cool. Let's hear them. Way, wayside, population of 29, just off the highway, a sign just off the highway proclaims. Houses boarded, pickups and blocks off narrow streets, bare ghosts. Only life I see is at the grain weighing station where shipments are received. And I take a break from controlling traffic while the sun shines relentlessly. Sand dunes abound and bear their histories, a westward passage and revelations like dreams of early explorers. Part two, broken state highway in Northeast Nebraska, loose asphalt covers a road a road that may arcs its way through a settlement of small white houses, nobody home, a brief stop at a convenience store for locals, a revolution, a revelation, the day lies in shadows. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks for sharing both those. That population 29, I always wonder what it would be like to live in a town like that, you know? Uh, we were, the we passed a bunch of, uh, yeah, we passed a bunch of ghost towns, you know, those mining towns around on our little road trip this summer. And I don't know, it'd be interesting. It'd be neat to see one. I don't know if you can classify that as a ghost town, but all the houses look boarded up to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks for sharing those, Mike. Always a pleasure. Okay, thanks. Yep, take care. Uh, let's go to Angela Gartner next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela. How you doing tonight? Good. Just tired. I I am first day of college semester today. Oh. So <laughs> I'm teaching. I'm like... <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> uh -huh. so, did you say you're teaching? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. So is that something you've always done? Well, this is my second semester. Mm -hmm. um, I, I taught in spring and now in fall. And I'm still working full time as an editor, too. So mm -hmm. is it journalism I, you're teaching? Yeah. Uh, very cool. I didn't know. Well, I hope, hope it goes well. How, what, how do you like it after a one semester? Um, I really loved the first one. It, it was uh, the first one's media writing, and I'm doing media writing and professional communication. So mm -hmm. for this semester, so it's it's fun. I just, you know, I I really believe in young journalists and hoping to, you know, because there's got to be people behind us. Yeah, and for sure. I believe in journalism, so we gotta keep it going. <laughs> is it a, is it a tough? I mean, it seems like a tough career to like get into, given the state of journalism and like the funding sources. Are the are students like? You know, usually you think of journalists, young ones, as like, I'm going to change the world with my writing and all that. Is there an optimism to it? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think actually, you know, there has been like this downers about the industry, but I disagree with that. I think, you know, with so many options yeah. of online, social mm -hmm. media, like, and, you know, people like uh, magazines, like everything is digital and it's just a different way to consume media now and it's a different way of journalism mm -hmm. so it can still be visual like visual audio uh video i mean it's just there's so many ways that mm -hmm. you can consume media so i i think it's actually an exciting time for young journalists yeah very cool well it makes me want to take your class i wish i could <laughs> <laughs> you can now <laughs> I mean, you got to come in person which yeah, is might that'd be, be, a long, long. be a bit of a commute for me but yeah. uh, anyway so what do you want to share well, actually, it's funny because um, I wouldn't have been doing this if I didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. And I went to college as an adult um, oh, yeah. because I thought I could break in the field, you know, and, and not. And I was actually the, you know, I kind of say in the poem, but I was the first in my family to graduate from college. So, you know, it is I'm still paying my college loans and with Biden's, um, you know, a little relief. Um, I just want to write a poem about it because, you know, there's so much negativity around it. But for mm -hmm. people like me, I'm like, it's going to help me. It's just a little bit of relief. Mm -hmm. And but, you know, there are bigger problems around it, like the interest interest rates are just terrible yeah. on my loans. But, you know, it's it's good to see 
someone doing something little about it because you know, when you take it, it's just, especially in as an adult, you just want to get ahead. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't have your parents backing, you don't have anything and you just take the loans because that's all you can do. If you don't take the loans, you can't go to school. So, um, and I didn't go some, and, you know, as a working adult, you have to work around your schedule and for college, it's not like, you know, you, you're not, you know, at that time, you know, I just, um, I was, you know, pregnant with my son. So it's kind of like one of them, but Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's something that I feel that, you know, for working adults, like we need that and we're willing to pay, but I'm, I just wish the interest rates would be really lower. Yeah. I mean, they should be, uh, they should be pegged to inflation. I think, you know, I mean, cause it's like the GI bill, you invest in, invest in the citizens of the country. It pays back in the end. It's investment in a kind of infrastructure. So um, anyway, so is it math poems? Yeah. Math math problems. I mean, Okay. Yep. Math poems. I got poems <laughs> on the brain. <laughs> math problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not good at math, so this is perfect for me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have two poems, so this is the first one. Yeah. Um, okay, math problems. The numbers were all relevant, but I'm not good at equations. I was a pregnant receptionist humming softly to my belly, thinking I just need to try. After all, college seemed like winning the shimmery ticket out of our poverty. I was the, I would be the first in the family to hang a frame degree. I had to play the game of grades, but I wasn't good at math. The calculated algorithm told me what I would spend. The addi- additions and subtractions and future sums in my name, they were just decimals to me, floating above the shaky water. The hole widened and sank. Lone shark circled with interest. I didn't figure the bite of the percent until my head was under the waves. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Good ex- explanation of how it goes. And then uh, the next one is books should be left alone. So what's this about? Well, I am a big reader and you might have heard my, my, my puppy was having a little, <laughs> you might, sorry, you heard little, um, and you might see lightning once in a while. We're having oh, a big thunderstorm. I'm so jealous. I can't, it's just not fair. Why is everybody in a thunderstorm but me? <laughs> just got to come back to the East coast, you know? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Okay. Uh, no but but you know a lot of you know there's that whole movement around the banned books and this was kind of about like you know the texas and there was actually a library in michigan who they voted for a levy for the library and they voted it down and Mm -hmm. the library is actually going to close because of a book that they didn't agree with so and i i lived at the library um you know, when I was in high school and I was just thinking, I was wondering what kind of books are these kids allowed to read? Cause I discovered so many great books that I probably wouldn't have discovered if I didn't go to the library mm-hmm. and it's, and it's books that I'm not sure uh, I quoted in the poets respond. This was a poets respond um, the life and death of Andy Warhol. And it, it blew my mind, mm-hmm. you know, and I was thinking would that book even like be in my son's library. Cause I, we went to an orientation and I was like, Ooh, the library, you know, I was excited, but I didn't get to like see all, you know, what they're mm-hmm. reading, but it's kind of like, I can't imagine not having some of these books in the library and the kids just to discover it, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it, that's what it is. It's not really like teachers are handing it to them. They're just discovering reading. Yeah. 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 It's true. So let's see books. Uh, books should be left alone. Go ahead. And this is kind of a weird poem, but (laughs) it just like came out of my head. So Um, books should be left alone. Dear reader, or there's someone who doesn't appreciate words so carefully chiseled from a mind that crossed them out twice before choosing them for a printed page. I would like to challenge the decisions made. Please imagine a bird on a rock. It could be any type of feather friend you see fit, perhaps a goldfinch or common starling. It was the perfect spot to sit in the sun. The bird didn't go and find another. It took in the sound to the river stream, walked on the edge, hoping to see a worm, waiting for someone to go from a dream, go somewhere, waiting for somewhere to go from a dream. It left when the brown bear was crunching on the fish he caught from an old man's net. Because the mesh hole was so big, he decided to throw it in the garbage. The bear was left with its tasty meal, the bird had a place to rest his sharp toes, and no one bothered to tell them no. 
Oh, very interesting poem there. That's you went surprising places for sure. Books should be left alone. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Have a great night, Tim. Yep, you too. Good night. And, and get a good night's sleep too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Bye>. definitely. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Okay. And let's go to Jennifer Elise Wang next. Hey. Hey, Jen. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. We got our thunderstorms in the weekend, so yeah. <laughs> and you're in like the Bay Area? Is that where you are? No, I, I'm in Texas, so oh, yeah, okay. we really needed it, and mm-hmm. it, it kind of monsooned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, that is good. So what do you have to share today? Uh, I have my poets respond, which <laughs> it segues nicely from Angela's because it's uh-huh. related to school administrators, and uh, I wrote this kind of finding out that the school district I grew up in, in um, <laughs> passed a measure to ban any sort of discussion on gender fluidity, mm-hmm. which uh, based on the technicality includes the word transgender, uh-huh. which is very outrageous. Yeah, and, that's a little extreme, I would say. Yeah, and so I, it made me think about how as an adult, I came out as non-binary and how Demi Lovato, who also was in my school district, mm-hmm. also came out as non-binary uh, when they were older. And so I just, kind of wrote this poem thinking about our experiences growing up and being bullied and then how much like worse this is going to be. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's hear it. To the conservatives of Grapevine, Coleyville ISD. Yeah, Coleyville ISD. Uh, did I not get an invite to my 10-year high school reunion, despite being the class salutatorian, because you were afraid I'd say the same things Demi Lovato did about middle school? Now, that whole district is the nation's laughingstock, a warning of a fascist future, and you're trying to discredit us by pointing out that she went to rehab and I take my clothes off in front of people and we hang out with these so-called groomers. To quote a movie I watched in drama class, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. Since the only groomer is the one you married right after your graduation and his 29th birthday. And our friends are merely entertainers who wear too much glitter for your comfort. Now you're trying to ban the existence of kids like the ones you bullied, erase their identity like Demi and I tried to erase our differences, cutting at our skin and destroying ourselves inside before we really knew who we were to fit in with the white upper middle class cishet mold of a teen who didn't work too hard and didn't stand out. You'll never admit to genocide and you'd pretend to be sad if we actually died because I did the same with another bully I had many mutuals with. But there's going to be the ones who weren't lucky enough like us to make it out only to hear you joke about our addiction, anxiety, and depression. Still, you will never be rid of the gender fluid goths, the fat femmes, the black ballroom queens, the hip hop hijabis, the neurodivergent nerds, the punk boys in pink, the future pop stars, scientists, poets, and leaders, all the ones bullies call queer and weird because while your position on the board has an end date, our art, our music, our words are forever. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, Jenna, yeah, was great. And, and, uh, yeah. yeah, and I was going to add that uh, one of the other influences behind this was that my French drag show also got protested. So there was that little reference about being called groomers, even though the drag show was at her family's distillery. So like oh, this was yeah. a purely family friendly thing. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, the controversy only wound up getting more attendees. So, you know, yeah, it well, worked out for our benefit. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that and keeping us uh Abrised of all that stuff. Thanks, thanks, John. Yeah, thank you. Um, next up is uh, Mary Ann. Oh, but you're on mute still. There Hello, you go. how are you? Yeah, good. How are you doing? Good. So this is about uh, the the prompt as you know where you have lived before, mm-hmm. and mine is called the Year of Four Dwellings. Ultimatum given, but you never sought to heed a word. Now, nowhere to turn after three decades and three years, after many agonizing tears, leaving behind the home on center because of your lack of unity. Political aspirations and entanglements were more important. Moving up the mill rock with clothes and cats in tow, leaving for work the next day in absolute angst. While putting that familiar smile for the entire world to see, Sure, Rock had more than enough amenities of that former home. What a switch, a parent having to move in with the child in order to escape his father. Watching the stars poolside, smelling the sweet smoke of steak, happily trying to gain some sort of self, only to be ripped away again. 
fleeing from an unpleasant encounter, driving so fast with clothes and cats in tow. Now the child must live with the parents, something that was left behind 33 years ago. How could this be happening? Scale back dwelling place, sharing the room with the sibling, sleeping on an inflatable bed hidden in a corner, no privacy to grieve, no yard to tend, lost flowers and vegetable gardens, being bombarded with questions, hearing my mother's tears and pleas to go back. While my dad's anger over his pending death permeated every room, smells of 1970s recipes wafted around the apartment, feeling ever so trapped, trying to make sense while nothing made sense of why divorce is so cruel. Loss of love, loss of self, loss of family, loss of friends, loss of home. Finally solace in a long lost childhood acquaintance, moving yet again with clothes and cats in tow. To a familiar ancestral neighborhood near Philo, this place of refuge still provides the peace of where pretense does not exist. It is where Lebanese food and culture are celebrated. It is where woodland creatures dwell, are fed and admired. It is where the porch is a gathering place for all. It is where creativity has no bounds. It is where love resides. Surely this is my final step before the heavenly destination. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks for so much for sharing that story. Very important one, the year of four dwellings. And then uh, did you want to do another one too? Yes, I have another one uh, from a word prompt that another community I belong to. Mm -hmm. And it kind of had shades of, you know, um, Andy Rooney with his uh, informational quips. I loved Andy Rooney. We all grew up with him. Did you see so the, uh, the paper clips poem last week? Did you catch that? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I, I love that. that. <laughs> so this is called a description of postmodern mini. It all started out with a description for the classic short skirt, the mini. Now, Mini is accompanied with all sorts of commercialized and modernized categories. Mini waffles, such as a nice bite-sized breakfast. Mini cheap, mini burgers called sliders. Mini Cooper, which is a British-made car built for everyone. A mini millisecond of your time. Mini vacation, a three to four day holiday. A mini or tiny house movement, an avocation for living with less. Mini chocolate chip cookies, just one bag will equal one large chocolate chip cookie. There is mini me, a tiny carbon copy of me, only smaller, like my daughter when she was a child. Mini bar, I guess for a single serving size, bottles of booze. Mini quiz, three multiple choice questions, 10 seconds, five points and go. Uh, let's see. A mini television series, a concept that was started in the 1970s with the six week run, The Duke comes to mind. But now a mini series is watched on my iPad. I guess that counts as a mini. My favorite one of all is Minnie Mouse minus the NIE. But of all categories, medium is the least used. We love our super sized, we love our large size, we love our mini sized. But for now, I'll have a medium seltzer water with high fructose corn syrup. Can I have a medium bag of wedge fried potatoes to go with that order? Thank you and keep the change. <laughs> that was great. That was really funny. That there is Thank so you. many so much mini out there. Thanks for sharing that. There is. Yeah, very Thank fun you, poem. Too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah, that was Mary Ann Abdo with uh, two poems there. Uh, let's go to uh, Brent Stauffer next. And then we got one more. Mark Grinier's here, too. So I'll do Brent, then Mark. Hey, Brent. How you doing? Hey, Jim. I'm doing great. How are you, other than being too dry? <laughs> other than that, we're good. Uh, little Little League starting up. Uh, school's back in session. Just life sort of getting back into the gold, good old routine. Um, yeah, so good yeah. times around here. Uh, what do you got to share with us? Oh, well, I have a uh, medium length file. Uh-huh. Perfect. Uh not long. They're not short either. Um, uh, again, I, I, I need to give myself more time because <laughs> I, 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 I end up having more to say than I thought. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a little bit of a rush job. Uh, no edits what to speak, to speak of so far. And, uh, I, you know, I've lived in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. 
Uh-huh. So I think I think two of the more interesting ones, and um, I might come back to this idea mm-hmm. and add add some more places. Yeah, it could make but a little like chapbook or something. I mean, I lived in we I counted up. I lived in uh, yeah. twenty twenty two, not including this one. The first twenty thirty years, I lived in twenty two places, and then the same place the last twelve. So, wow, a lot yeah, of places. That is- with Tim, I would read that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all, I mean, it's just all around the same town, though. I didn't move, my, I lived in two, two, like, areas, but then we just moved almost every year. So it was, like, a different neighborhood and a different people, and, yeah. So, or you could do a long train poem that mm-hmm. encompasses all. That'd be hard. Those things just come out on their own, though. You never know where they're going to go. So you can't, you can't control the train. <laughs> Okay. Well, I do enjoy them. They're always good. Okay, so let's see. Um, the two, two places I yeah. Go ahead whenever uh, you're ready. I got it right here. <laughs> okay. Um, one, 1986. Oh, glorious green building. Your architect was hammered on mescaline and muscadine wine. Your jumbled up insides with their Escher like stairs. One warm flight went nowhere. Mapped marvelously after our psyches, holding college off at arm's length, me and Stephen and our questionable ill fell upon you like hungry pirates or termites. When Harper and then Samantha took off, we changed your name from Alice to Fresh, though the plaque still claimed L.A. Royale. What a joke. We burrowed into our sorrows like a proper twin set of young birds. In the abandoned apartment below, one night I busted all the windows out with my bare fists. No green building, I'm sorry. It wasn't your fault. I read The Dead and thought, that guy who died singing in the snow had the right idea about love. Two, 2010. Oh, asylum, you experiment in intentional community perched like a satisfied cat high upon Red Mountain, gazing with your giant glass eyes over the magic city. For over a decade, you've housed painters, dancers, writers, music makers, silk walkers, and fire breeders. Like the Infinite Hotel, you've always got one room more. Like Canton, you contain a never-ending array of intendants. In your sky there, suspended above the lights of downtown, me and Esperanza are so nakedly and simply together. Our long, straight bodies join like gray clouds form. Oh, Asylum, I'm so glad at long last to have found you. And so the morning comes. This night will never end. Yeah, that was good stuff. Thanks so much for sharing that, Brent. I loved especially the end of the first uh, the first section. But yeah, I could see a whole a whole group of, group of poems like that from a little chapbook or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it was a really good process. Yeah, very cool. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing that. It's always a pleasure, Brent. All right. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Yep, take care. Bye. And then uh, Mark Grinier's here, too. Let's call up Mark. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Oh, you're still on. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hey, Mark. Um, I don't have a prompt, a poem from this prompt, but I, I, I wrote one for a prompt you did like, like a month or two ago uh-huh. about writing a poem based on an aphorism. Ah, I remember that one, yeah. Okay, so what was the uh, aphorism? A stitch in time Ah, takes saves nine. (laughs) And the title is A Stitch in Time. Okay. Repairing the gaping rip in those old jeans of mine, I wish it was only nine times I'd have to push that needle through to the other side of the faded blue denim I've worn for years. They seem a remnant of better times when thrifty practice was less temp- less important than now it is, when carefree days of sun and shade brought singing birds and burbling streams full of fish and happy dreams, dreams from old poor Richard's time, the legacy of thrifty days and victories for our side. Moral clarity looked out on an ambiguous world where what we think we know is less obscure than what time has taught us is true, as blue as clear spring sky or old blue jeans worn soft and faded after days of work or months of play, where saving time may represent the sign of too much care, of too much fear for what may come in the best of times, 
to aging bones becoming frail, faltering on the edge of decrepitude, where old age looms as poor and wan as another itch from another land, become the screed for days dying in invaded homes, destroyed by crimes and fraudulent wars, that shrivel lives escaping from some great wide rent in the social fabric that sunders each from all of us alone and naked, stripped at last of the too worn fabric of faith and love, of caring for ourselves and others straining to pull blue thread, uh, of caring for ourselves and others, straining to pull blue thread on through to the other side, stipping, stif, stitching up these damaged times, lies worn thin, too threadbare now to bear the thrust of living atone, and abandoned here to the fate we've cast to the winds, again the fearful doubts that we can win a future fair enough for us and for our kin in well-worn jeans and faded tees from years gone by, surviving into quiet times where sewing things up on a shady porch or out in the world seems worth the work and might even be thought virtuous again. Yeah, that was excellent. Great, great poem. Great reading. Love the rhythms of it. The stitching thank time. You. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mark. Okay, thank you. Bye. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care. Yeah. Um, that was Mark Grinier with um, A Stitch in Time. I'm going to close up the Zoom now, and let's see if we have any other uh, other people who wanted to sh me to read some. Uh, oh, we got Nivedita, of course. Let me pull up uh, Nivy's poem here. See how quickly it downloads this time. Um, in the meantime, while that's downloading, let's read uh, Ted Guevara's poem really quick. Um, Ted says, I stayed um, in each of these places for at least two years, in Indianapolis for some 20, 30 years. Jaro is a little town where I was born in the central Philippines. The photo depicts public transportation to this day. If you're inside, you're safest, but not so cool. <laughs> so here is this photo, the uh, St. Jude bus, and look at all the kids. Here we go, all the, all the people uh, riding on the roof of the bus. Pretty pretty uh, snazzy, fancy ride, though. I like that. So um, that was uh, Ted Guevara's image they included, and here's his poem, Five Snaps. Jaro, crossing the street looked dangerous, but the jeepneys were guardian angels. They zipped on by with passengers not wearing seatbelts. Now how can the innocence of youth be memorable if a passenger fell in the open dust? There was a Virgin Mary that bled blue. It never caught on, even in Wikipedia. But that was the it that made drivers mindful of their precious cargo. 2. Perry Point All beliefs curled under the Potomac. We would fish an ideal American pastime, but all, caught, all we caught were eels. The walk to the pier from our trailer was scenic, stony, but the movements were graceful then. Face and body weren't looked at as much. Mirrors had normal functions then, and those were to keep the slick of fish fun in the bucket while Pop worked at the VA. Marion. The heaviest of the Smith Corona lined my palm as I tugged on their keys from classroom to classroom, loud as they were in the dark hard case. But would they stand my shaking? In the future, I mean. I cared, carried them so much, they developed motion sickness. So you're going to be a writer, huh, they'd say. Just don't be a cab driver. Indianapolis. You knew of her face, but masks from the rear dust kept you guessing. She was lovely from the same cloth, the same roots, had the same grin. The safety in those were a bliss maker. So you marry, plan the best moments of your life, like in a memo. There were impatience, petals on the floor when she left. You have yet to broom. This is Indianapolis, and here is Aiken, the last one, Aiken. Then all got exposed, the meanness of edges deemed soft and given in your unrelaxed life. All this time you thought you spoke from a, a self of suave and coolness, yet the bites of a small town aimed a camera at you, denuding the truth of your physicality, a true Mary that bled blue. You took a deep breath, straightened yourself, and turned off this camera. Actually, I really love those. It's great, great, Ted, to, uh, to see this journey, five snaps through... Uh, through life. I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, excellent poems, uh, Ted. And now let's go to uh, Nivy's poem. Actually, really quick, let me do, um, this is uh, a Potter O'Donohue's haiku. This is uh, 
a political haiku, he says. And I don't know if we can. Yeah, there we go. A political haiku. I heard what they said. Then I knew it was all lies. That's how it made sense. <laughs> Very good. Thanks for sharing that, Potter. I'm Potter O'Donohue with a political haiku. Let's see. Where'd they, um, where'd this go? Okay, Hello. here we go. My name oh. is Nivedi. Here is uh, Nivy's poem now. Um, this is uh, an ode to my hometowns, temporary as they may be. This is a uh, Nivy's poem, an ode to my hometown. So let me put this up. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Nivedita, and this is my attempt at the prompt poem for Atlacast. An ode to my hometowns, temporary as they may be. The city by the sea, with the dubious distinction of being the only Indian city to be bombed during both world wars. That was back when it was Madras and not Chennai. The city by the sea, with the world's second longest beach. Marina Beach, with its roasted peanuts and pickled mangoes and filter coffee. The city by the sea, with the music and dance season in December, the home of Bharatanatyam and Carnatic music. Margari season comes alive. The city by the sea, home to the original Malagatani and Chicken 65. Also called Rasam in Tamil, Malagatani is just one of the many variants of Rasam. The city by the sea that was once home to me. The city of dreaming spies with the distinction of being the inspiration behind Alice in Wonderland and Lord of the Rings. Lewis Carroll also wrote treatises on mathematics here, being a professor. The city of dreaming spies housing buildings of every style of English architecture, many of which are seen in its eponymous university buildings. The city of dreaming spies where the first four mile run, four minute mile was run, and punting and fencing are a way of life. The city of dreaming spires, where the time used to be five minutes, two seconds behind GMT, and students in university counts wander around town day and night. The city of dreaming spires that was once home to me. The very modern city with the distinction of being called the Millennium City of India. Gurgaon, or sorry, Gurgaon, is well home for now. The very modern city that is one of the most polluted capital regions in the world. Every breath chokes your lungs and makes you cough till your eyes tear up. The very modern city where buying groceries necessitates a trip to the mall. The joys of a trip to a mall long forgotten, for it has now become a chore. The very modern city where you're either sweating buckets or freezing your toes off. Get ready to pile on the sweaters or take off the layers, for indoor heating and cooling are not really a thing here. The very modern city that was once home to me. But all these homes pale in comparison to my final home, your final home, our final home, our permanent home where we can all meet and just be. That final home is awaiting us. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure to always. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nivi. Always a joy seeing your poems. Um, and that is going to be it for the uh, open lines tonight. Let's go to um, the let's go to the uh, Saiku for this week. And the Saiku was this. So uh, it comes from this article, which was really interesting from um, um, po- or Science Daily is where this comes from. It was researchers at does it say where they're from? Um, all over the place. It was research published in Cell Journal, but this is the article right here. Um, if I can actually put it up. Mosquitoes have neural fail-safes to make sure they can always smell humans. Um, when female mosquitoes are looking for a human bite, they smell a unique cocktail of body odors that we admit into the air. These odors then stimulate receptors in the mosquito's antenna. Scientists have tried deleting these receptors in attempts to make humans undetectable to mosquitoes. However, even after knocking out an entire family of odor-sensing receptors from the mosquito genome, mosquitoes still find a way to bite us now. Um, now, a group of researchers found that mosquitoes have evolved redundant fail-safes in their olfactory system that makes sure they can always smell sense. 
And so, um, yeah, so, so mosquitoes have this really complicated sense of smell um, and, and a whole bunch of ways to smell us, which is one of the reasons they're really hard to avoid. And maybe, as someone pointed out, maybe uh, one of the reasons why some people get um, bit by mosquitoes more often than others. So uh, that was some interesting research. Just made me think about mosquitoes. And then here's my Saiku, which I put into a little Saiga. Uh, this is a, a photo as well, just for fun. And here's the Saiku for the week. Smack in the middle of summer mosquitoes smack in the middle of summer mosquitoes that is your saiku for this week and that is the show for this week next week's um prompt is going to be right here um, it's a bit of a long one this is from um linda nemick foster of course and the prompt goes like this um, using online resources about visual art select a painting that's a portrait it doesn't have to be a famous person that's the subject of the painting. For example, Mona Lisa or Van Gogh, only that the portrait intrigues you. In your poem, assume the voice of that person and imagine a backstory for your other self. How does it feel to be looked at all the time? Is there anything in the background of the painting that may differ or may offer a glimpse into this other person's life you're trying to imagine? In writing persona poems, we not only write in the perspective of the first person, but we try to totally... Uh, try to totally assume the voice of that other, the thoughts, feelings, and sensibilities. Lose yourself and let your imagine take off. That is your prompt for this week. So we're going to look up uh, a portrait painting, and we're going to embody that person as an other self. That is the prompt for this week, uh, and that is the show for this week. Thanks, everybody, for uh, watching and participating. It's always a pleasure. Next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be Rachel Malalu. Uh, Rachel's been on uh, Poet Respond, I think, twice. Um, she's an ER doctor. Um, and so she's had poems about that. Her new book is A History of Resurrection. You can kind of imagine maybe what the topic might be. It's uh, Labor Day here in the United States, but we're doing it regular time Monday, uh, September 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Even though it's Labor Day, it's the regular time on Monday. Rattlecast number 158. And uh, with that prompt to uh, use, a, use a portrait and then write about the other self. Uh, you give the voice to the portrait. That is your prompt for this week. And then we'll talk to uh, Rachel Maddow in Rattlecast number 158. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.